this morning, amen? Amen. 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 Thank you guys for being here on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, a couple of the events coming up, we got a small group uh, Wednesday night at 6.30. Uh, we're studying the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, please come out and be with us. Uh, hear more of God's word and understand God's word. That's the main thing. You know, we can all read the Bible. And the uh, scriptures say that even the demons know the word and shut. But the thing about it is, do we understand it? Do we understand what it says and why it's saying it? They always talk about who is talking, uh, who are they talking to, and what is the subject about. And that's what we study on Wednesday nights. Also, Vacation Bible School, July 10th through the 14th. Uh, please come out. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet to volunteer for that. We still need some volunteers for that. Uh, please sign on in the sheet where you can uh, come and be a part of that with us. Uh, we're going to be on the work day here in the next few weeks or so. We want to clean up our parking lot, uh, kind of get some of the grass out. Uh, we need it. Put some uh, weed filler down. Uh, we're going to need some help with that. So uh, we'll be putting that in the bulletin once I figure out how to get back to the bulletins. Uh, we replaced our uh, computer with a new one, and it's, I'm having a hard time finding some things off the old one. So I'll just be patient for that. Uh, today I want to talk to you about unity. In August of 1987, there was supposed to have been a world-changing event. According to the New Age movement, it was a time for tremendous harmonic convergence. There were some unusual conditions of the planets that their elliptical orbits around the sun, and according to the New Age leaders, was going to be something that we've never seen before. In the arrangement of the planets, would continue until 1992 to prepare us for visitors from another world in the next century. You see, they were studying and felt like that all the planets were going to come together in alignment and we were supposed to see extraterrestrial people come to Earth. This is what the New Age people believed. So New Agers gathered on Mount Shasta in California, at a canyon in New Mexico, in Channing Rock in Texas, Serpent Mound in Ohio, the Great Pyramids of Gaza in Egypt, at Glastonbury, the home of King Arthur in England. And according to the New Age leadership, at least 144,000 people had to grab hands at the same time. How significant that number? 144,000 people. We see in the book of Revelation that 144,000 people will be saved during the time of tribulation, and we understand that to be 12,000 people from the 12 tribes of Judah. But isn't that significant that these New Age people thought that the ETs were going to be coming to Earth, and that for us to bring them down here, we had to gather 144,000 people. If we had done that, they believed it would tune us into the vibrations of this dynamic convergence. Obviously, their predictions never came true. And the whole story would be funny, except that it really tells us something about people in our society today who don't know the Almighty God. There is a tragic, empty longing that people have to belong to a group of people that are joined together in the pursuit of something better, joined together and seeking a better life. You see, I often say that people are going to search for somebody to follow. It doesn't matter what they believe in. We saw people that followed um, Jones in, in Texas, that he killed all those people in a mass murder. People are always looking for someone to follow. Oh, isn't it great that we have an opportunity to let people know that we serve the Almighty God and that we can be okay no matter what happens as long as we serve Him. We are able to lead people to Him. We don't have to have 144,000 people. We can do it one person at a time. I believe I talked to the guys this morning that uh, God has been really convicting my heart in the last couple of weeks, and I think it's uh, ever since Andrea's event that we had here, and going back online and seeing how many lives she touched as one person. Over almost 800 people had watched her service online. I'm sorry, 400 people watched it, 300 were here. So almost 800 had seen her um, in one way or another. Wouldn't that be magnificent it's if each one of us in here today would touch 800 lives? If each of us can have the influence upon 800 
people. How many people could we win for Jesus Christ? They say you win anywhere between 1% and 2% of the people that you talk to. So just think about what the numbers would be if each and every single one of us in here talked about talked to 800 people. We can win a lot of souls for Christ. But the thing about it is, are we willing to get out and reach people where they are? You see, we are so often delegated in our church today, not this church, but in churches today, that we would like to open our doors and we expect people to flood in to our church. That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that we are to go and make disciples. What does that mean? That means that we have to take action, that we have to be able to get out and do something that we're not comfortable with. I know you may say, well, Tim, that, that, that's really not my forte. I'm not good at talking to people. Why can't you tell people what Jesus has done for you? Amen. That's all we have to do. I can promise you that every single person in here has gone through something. But how did you get through that something? With the love, the mercy, and grace of Jesus Christ. So when you're talking to that person, you may say, well, you don't know what I've gone through. I know I don't, but I have a Jesus that does. And he's willing to help you get through it just like he helped me get through it. That's right. You see, that's all we have to do. That's the simple faith of going out and telling people about Jesus Christ. But we're okay with coming into the church and loving each other and saying, hey, I love you. Good to see you this morning. Oh, my gosh, I haven't seen you since last Sunday. You know, because we're not willing to do anything but once a week. You see, the, I was listening to a study the other day that says the average person looks at their telephone three to four hours a day. But we're not willing to give Jesus one hour a week. Yeah. Why? Because that's my only day off. That's the day that I have to cut my grass. You know, I saw my neighbors this morning, and, and I was talking to them. Good morning, how you guys doing? Oh, we're off to the beach. Well, it was just as nice yesterday as it's supposed to be today. Yeah. But today's easier to go to the beach because probably not many people are going to be there because some people will be at church. You see, we often want to do the things that please us, but we don't want to do the things that please Jesus. But when it comes to the time when we need him, oh, he's the most important thing in our life. You see, we can call on him when we need him, but we don't thank him for everything that he's doing for us now. You see, when you woke up this morning, that's called a mirror. Amen. When you take every breath in your body, that's called a mirror. Amen. You see, I was looking at the gene that they called the other day, and the scientists call it the gene that holds everything together. Guess what it is? It's in the shape of a cross. Amen. Why? Because when Jesus died upon that cross, it unified us together with believers in Christ that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which he sent his son to die upon that cross so that we may be united as one. You see, nothing can separate us from that. They can try all they want to. They can say, you can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. But guess what? Our forefathers knew hundreds and hundreds of years ago that there would be a problem with people not us not wanting us to go to church. But they said, you know what? No, no, no. We're going to put into place an amendment that says you have the right to go to church. Amen. Amen. Why don't we exercise that right on a regular basis? You know, we often have the same people doing the same things all the time. Why? Because we're not willing to go out and get more. You know, our podcast, we got a brand new podcast, and I thank my guys for voting on that, and we can get it. And now we can see where people are watching us from before we can do that. Andrew's event that we have here was watched from people in 22 states. But now we have a greater opportunity because Chris has the opportunity now that as people are watching live on TV, guess what he can do? He can chat with us. We didn't have that option before. Hey, good morning. Glad you could be with us today. We thank you for joining us. Hey, if you're ever in the area, we would love to have you. You see, it's important for us to do things. It doesn't matter because Jesus says that when you do something for me, it's going to cost you something. It may be a family member. It may be a house. It may be a job. It may be money. But we need to do it because there is nothing that is too expensive for when 
we spent the money. Why? Because we want to reach more. It's time for us to get up and say, no more. It's time for us to get up and say, we got to do more. How many people do you talk to about Jesus every week? Do I got to challenge you with the 90 day challenge to talk to somebody about Jesus every day? We should want to do that. Yeah. We shouldn't have to be challenged to do that. Right. You see, Jesus challenged us that when he says, go and make disciples. I don't need to challenge you. He already has. Amen. How many of us now that the 90 day challenge is over? We don't turn that radio station over to secular music. Why? Because I got to challenge you to listen to Christian music. How many of us said the 90 day challenge is over? We don't read scripture anymore as much as we used to. Oh, I'll get around to it. You shouldn't have to be challenged to read God's word. Why? Because we're unified as one, and we should all want the same thing, and that's a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. The only way we get that is to read his word and to understand who he is and what he's saying to us. Jesus described this for us, and he prayed. We're not going to read all of John 17, 20 through 26. But Jesus says in there that everything that I do, Lord, Father, I do it for your glory. If you can't take this cup away from me, but not my will, your will be done. How many of us in church can say today say, God, I don't want my will for this church. I want your will for this church. Let us touch the people in this city that need to be touched. I remember when this city was one of the greatest cities to live in. Not anymore, but it can be again if we show them the love of Jesus Christ. That is the only way we'll bring our city back unified is through the love of Jesus Christ and through the love of each one of us that they see Jesus in us. I would think that before Jesus was crucified, when he was in the, the garden, that he was praying for strength, don't you? Father, give me the strength to get through this. I know I can't do it without you. Yeah. I know that this is going to be terrible, but I can do it with you. Because I know what your word says. I can do all things through you who strengthen me. What are you going through today that you can't get through? Jesus can help you get through it. It's not a maybe. It's not a but. It's a promise that he made to us that he would help us to get through whatever we need to get through. He says, the same glory you gave me, I give them so that they may be what? Unified. Unified and together as we are. You see, Jesus wants us to be as close to Him as He is to the Father. He wants us to be unified as one. I and them and you and me. Then they will be mature in this oneness and give the godless world evidence that you sent me and love them in the same way you love me. Jesus knew that Christians could never make a lasting impact on the world unless spiritually they saw Jesus inside of each one of us. We will never make an impact on a dark world without the light of Jesus in our hearts. We have to shine so brightly that no matter how dark it gets, there will be light. What is darkness? Do you know you can't study darkness? Why? Because it's just the absence of light. Why has the world become dark? Because they took away the light. Yeah. They said, we don't need you anymore. We don't need you anymore. You know why? Because we want all these things that we want. We want the homosexuality. We want the gays. We want all this stuff. We want to do what we want to do. We don't need you anymore. And guess what Jesus said? Okay, I'll let you 
We just need to continue to pray for it. You know, I just uh, text uh, Senator Lucas this morning, and uh, because God has really been upon my heart, man, about this discipleship thing, and we've got to do more about it. Man. And I said, uh, Senator Lucas, I want to meet you at the Senate, at the, at the State Capitol building, and I got some things that I want to run past you and about discipleship and things like that. And one of the things I want to do when we get there is I want to say, take me into where you guys vote. And I'm going to stand there. And I'm going to say, God, make this your place. Amen. Amen. Make this a place to where hearts are changed. Amen. To where minds are changed. Where the decisions that are made are no longer their will, but your will. You see, we've got to start somewhere, guys. If you don't know how to start, let's get together. Let's think of a way to start. You know, we want Lori Ann. She's here because of a video. A video that we showed one night at Light Tree Cafe. Everybody wants to be somebody. Everybody wants to be loved. Let's love them like Jesus loved us to the point that if we have to die for them, we will die for them. Jesus was praying for believers here and says, the same glory you gave me, give them. In Ephesians 4, we're going to go through that, but we're not going to read it all in one time. The whole story is about creating unity. First three sums it up when Paul tells them, always keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit and bind together yourselves together with peace. People say, well, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. It doesn't say that in the Bible. Look what Paul says there. Keep yourselves united in the Holy Spirit and bind yourselves together with peace. Come together. The Bible says, do not cease coming together as a lot of you are in the habit of doing. Why? Because we need each other to be strong. It's easy for us to one of us to stray away if we're by ourselves than it is if we're within a group of those who love Jesus Christ. Amen. We stay strong together. So Paul takes up where Jesus left off and says, we need to always Live in unity and peace toward each other. The first one Paul says is unity comes when we lead a life worthy of the calling. In verse 1 through 3 it says, Therefore I, a prisoner, to serve the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Listen to the next thing. Be humble and gentle. You see, I think what we're going to start doing here is I want to encourage my guys and, and, and ladies, if you want to go with them, please don't go by yourself. But if you go with a guy, I think we ought to stand up at the food line on London Boulevard. I think we ought to stand up on the Walmart at Frederick Boulevard. And I think we ought to just ask, as people come in, hey, is there anything in your life that I can pray for you for? Don't say, hey, you know, I'm from Portland Christian Church. We would love you to come to church with us. Because it's not about coming to church. It's about knowing who Jesus is. Amen. How can we tell them more about Jesus unless we pray for them in their time of need? There may be somebody who breaks down and cries and says, you know what? Nobody has ever asked me that before. Nobody has ever cared before. Why do you care? Because Jesus loves you tremendously. That's why I care. Because Jesus brought me here because he knew you were going to be here. You see, I didn't just lay here by mistake. Jesus knows that wherever you go, he's there with you. So he will bring the people that are needed the most to hear from you. Don't give them this big spiel about, I'm a Christian, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and hey, at Portion Christian Church, we're starting to do this, whatever. No, hey, when can I pray for you? If they want to ask more questions, I'll ask more questions. If they don't, you just planted a seed in their life. That somebody loves them because Jesus loves you. You see, it's not about us. Even Jesus said, what about him? Well, think about when he, when he was raising Lazarus. What did he say? When he looked up, he said,
said, Jesus, uh, he says, Father, I know that you hear me. You have always heard me. So this I don't do for me. I do it for the people so that they may see you. So Jesus didn't do it for himself. He did it for the glory of the Father. Everything we do needs to be done for the glory of the Father. Let's stop worrying about how big our church is. Let's stop worrying about how many people we can bring in. Let's just love on the people where they are. Amen. We're to live with humility, with gentleness, and patience. Make an allowance for each other's faults. Does that describe you? Are you gentle? Are you humble? Are you peaceful? Are you worried so much about what other people are doing that you can't take care of yourself? You see, I've come to realize that it doesn't make any difference to me what the lawmakers do. As long as I do what Jesus wants me to do. If we can do that one person at a time, we can change a lot of things. Stop worrying about what other people are doing and worry about what you're doing. What are you doing? How many of us can say absolutely nothing? Well, I went to church on Sunday. Great. You should. How about Wednesday night? How about Saturday when we have a work day in the church? How about other days when I call you and say, hey, lady, let's go pray for this person, or let's go touch this person, or let's go talk to this person? Well, I would, but, you know, no softball game. What you're saying is that's more important than preacher or Christ. Yeah. Nothing should be more important than that. Amen. See, because I believe that when we stand before the Almighty God on the last day, and He stands there and we're standing before Jesus, He's going to look at me and say, what did you do? Well, I went to church every Sunday. Okay, that's one hour. How much did you look at your phone? Well, about three hours a day. Oh, so that was more important than living for me. You see, Jesus says that anything we put before him is an idol. He even says, if you love your mother or your father more than you love me, the love of me is not in you. I can't even love my wife more than I love Jesus Christ. And I love her dearly. I can't love my mom who's 96 years old, getting ready to be 96 years old, and one of the greatest ladies I've ever met, and one of the best Christians I've ever met. I can't love her more than Jesus. And I can promise you right now, if I was to say, Mom, who do I need to love more, you or Jesus? She'd say, absolutely, Jesus. Amen. It doesn't say I can do everything for my mom, does it? It says I can do everything with Jesus who strengthens me. Our church was just starting out about 25 or 30 people. And there was a couple of people who really wasn't happy with the direction that things were going in. I was kind of a, a wild person at that time. I wanted to do everything at one time. And, uh, not really had the money to do it, but uh, just wanted to do it. And I don't even remember what the issue was, but I know that it was going to be brought up in the leaders' meeting. We had to get it. In the days before the meeting, I thought about how to handle the discussion. I knew that I was right on what I was doing, and I was just going to go in and tell my body how right I was. You don't understand. I have this vision. This is the way we ought to do things. This is what I had planned in and going. And then one day when I was praying, I felt God told me to say absolutely nothing at the meeting just listen. Really out of character for me. And the meeting started, and I just listened, and pretty soon everybody noticed him was not acting normal. Is he sick? Is something wrong with him? So they asked me, Tim, why are you saying nothing? And I told them, I just felt like God told me to listen to you and not say anything. First of all, they were shocked. I'm not 
sure if it was because I'd heard from God or that I was keeping quiet. It was shocked for one of those reasons, either that I heard from God or I was quiet. But immediately he diffused the whole situation and the argument basically disappeared. You see, I never had to argue with anybody about it. God solved it on his own. So I've learned some lessons about dealing with people with humility, gentleness, and patience. First of all, we have to be worthy of our calling. Second of all, we have to focus on our common beliefs. Verse 4 through 6 says, we are, one, we are all one body. We have the same spirit, and we have all been called to the same glorious future. There is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And there is only one God and Father who is over all of us and all live through us. Notice what it says. One body, one spirit, one glorious future, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Even Paul says, I didn't come to baptize, I come to tell you about Jesus. And he says, I'm glad I didn't baptize some of you so that I can boast. You see, we all belong to one baptism, and that is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we can only be baptized because of what Jesus did for us. We can only be saved through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Because he was willing to suffer like nobody had ever suffered. Paul is saying here as believers, we got some big things in common that were really important. And he lists them. He says we got things that we all believe in, those things that we should hold together as in unity. Paul says that you don't have to agree on everything, but that you do have to stay together in unity. And that's one thing I say in our meetings that we may not agree on everything. We may not all vote the same way, but when we walk out of this room, we have to be unified as one. Because I believe that if our youth leaders in our church are not unified, the church will not be unified. It all starts with leadership. Psychology Today ran a story about Prince Marinette of Granada, who was there who was there to the Spanish crown about 200 years ago, but was convicted of treason. He was sentenced to life in solitary confinement in Madrid's ancient prison called the Place of the Skull. The prince was given only one book to read the entire time, and that's the Bible. But nothing else to read. He read the Bible hundreds and hundreds of times. He moved backwards and forwards. And after 33 years of imprisonment, he died. When he came to clean out his cell, they found some notes he had written, using nails to mark the soft stone of the prison walls. The notes were things like this, Psalms 118.8. In the middle of the verse of the Bible, Ezra 7, 21, contains all the letters of the alphabet except the letter J. The ninth verse of the eighth chapter of Esther is the longest verse in the Bible. No word or name more than six syllables can be found in the Bible. There were many other odd trivia facts written all over the walls. This guy spent 33 years of his life studying the greatest book of all time, yet all he learned was trivia. How important is the Word of God to you? Is it important enough for you to say, you know what, I understand what Tim says here on Sunday morning, but I want to hear what he says on Wednesday night because I want to know what the Word says deeper. You know, I was so uh, excited because um, Lynn had told me, she said, you know, when we were going through our 90 day challenge, she was going through the book of Revelation. And that's what we were reading. But she said, you know what I did, Tim? I took out your notes. And when you studied Revelations, and I went note by note by note, that's exciting to me. You know why? Because I understand that she wants to go on the Word. She doesn't want to read the Word. She wants to understand the Word. How many of us want to understand the Word? Not just read it. We can read any book. But we need to understand what it says. We were going through the book of Revelations a couple of years ago. And that time we did it on Tuesday nights. And I know there's many different interpretations of what Revelation actually means. When the millennium is, that's a hard one for me to say. How the rapture works with all the symbols, means, etc. And I went even, even I was teaching on one of the areas that a lady who wasn't from our church was there. She interrupted me and said, I don't agree with you. I think 
if you're wrong about that. And I think she really wanted to get in an argument. But I just said, that's great. You're welcome to disagree with me about that. Because this is one of the areas that a lot of Christians disagree. And I wouldn't argue with her. And I think she was disappointed that I didn't want to argue. But this wasn't an area that was worth causing division over. Unity comes when we focus on common beliefs. The crucial beliefs that bring us together, not the silly issues that separate us. You see, no matter how many times we study God's word, the devil's right there and he wants to separate us. He wants you to say, oh, you know what, I know what Tim is saying up there. Don't go listen to that. What did Jesus say? In the garden, he told him, he said, you can eat of any tree, but don't eat of the tree of life. Why? Because he knew that that was wrong. It's the only thing he's done they couldn't do. But think about what Satan said. Did he really say that? No, he really meant it. I, I know, I know. I, I was here when he spoke to you, and I understand what he said, but I don't think that's what he really meant. You see, that's what the devil wants people to do with you. He wants you to disagree. He wants you to question. He wants you to think about, oh, is it what he's saying is true? You know how I know what I say is true up there? Because it comes from God's word. That's the only truth we have. If I was to come up here and preach to you today on something that I thought was right, I'm not going to preach it to you. What I'm going to preach to you is what God says is right. Where he leads us. And the third unity comes when we use our gifts. How many of you know that each one of us have a gift? Amen. Every single one of us in this building here have a gift. Yeah. How do I know that? Because God promised it. What is your gift? Well, I, I know my gift ain't working with the kids. How do you know? Have you tried? Well, I know my gift is not singing. How do you know? Have you tried? Hey, <laughs> come on, Mike, please don't touch me. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I, I don't think my, my gift is cleaning the church. Why? Have you ever cleaned it? Well, I don't think my gift is coming out and using a weed eater. Guess what? That's a gift. Not everybody wants to do that. Well, you know, I don't really believe my gift is going up to the food line and telling people about Jesus. Have you tried it? You may find out that you're pretty good at it. You may find out that, that God has given you that gift and you didn't even know you had it. You see, but we got to take that little box that we got and take the lid off of it. Stop hiding under it and go for it. There's several different lists listed in the Bible. But I want you to notice the purpose of these gifts. <coughs> the main purpose is to help us to equip with God's word, build up the church and the body of Christ. All of us need to be equipped to do God's work. Have you ever heard of the redwoods trees in California? My wife and I have seen them, and they are absolutely gorgeous. Some of them are 200, 250 feet high. And, and I've got a picture of me standing at one like this, and it's wider than my arms are. That's how big these trees are. And they've been there for hundreds of years, but guess what their root system is? About 12 inches deep. You say, well, Tim, there's no way. A, 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 a tree that's 200 feet high cannot have uh, roots that are 12 inches deep. Yes, they can. You know why? Because they intertwine together. All the trees in the whole forest, river the forest, their roots go together. They're stronger when they're together. Yeah. The winds can't blow them over. Why? Because when one starts to struggle, it relies on the other one. When the wind starts to blow really hard and this tree says, oh my God, I'm getting ready to go. The other one says, no, you ain't. I got you. That's what we need to do. Yes. I can't take this no more. Yes, you can because I got you. I don't know how to do this. Yes, you do because I'm going to help you. How are we going to help each other? Through 
God's word. Amen. Don't do life alone. God wants us together, united as one for Him. The storms may come and the winds blow, but as long as we're together, we will not fall. Amen. As long as we're rooted. And I pray this morning that if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, that you never turn your life over to Him. That you never said, um, um, that, you know, God, I've been going through the struggles of life and I've been trying to handle this on my own, but I can't do it anymore. We have a Savior that loves you just as you are. A lot of people say, you know, I got to get this right, I got to get this right, I got to get this right. You will never get it right without me. Give your life over to Him. Let Him go from your life. So if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, this word I just ask that you come down. Let's change that. It's simple, easy, simple. Is that a story? I'll give you a few minutes Thank you for the opportunity to study your word.